The sting of death for the Christian, gone. Christ has taken that sting for us, and death is now a welcome friend. Death is disarmed. Death is defanged. Death just takes us into the presence of Christ. Type anti-aging into Google and you'll find anti-aging creams and medicines institutes all there to give you a sense that death is distant. Yet eventually, we all will die. So how can you have hope, even joy, when death is approaching? And encourage those that you love when they face a life-threatening illness or an injury. Find out next on Grace to You as John MacArthur begins a brand new study, The End is Not the End. Well, I think it's uh, fair to say that people, Christians included, avoid this topic, and that's understandable. After all, death separates loved ones and is often preceded by intense suffering. Yet, John, there are profound life-changing benefits in knowing exactly what death is like and what comes after it for believers and non-believers. Yeah, I think masking death is a very, very human enterprise. We don't want to talk about death. Uh, people don't want to think about death, but in spite of that, they wind up thinking about it. it uh, yeah, I read a study one time about junior high kids that said they think about death at least once every day. It's built in. That's where we're all headed. From the time a baby takes its first breath, it begins to die. At some point, that dying is consummated. So it's appointed unto men once to die. After that, the judgment. Nobody avoids that. How can we have such a massive, all-encompassing, all-inclusive reality as death with its finality and not be concerned to understand death and to understand that death is not the end? The end is not the end. Uh, we're going to take a look at that. 1 Corinthians 15 is going to be the text for this study, and it calls death the last enemy that will be abolished. And by the way, there are many believers who, uh, they say they believe, they profess to know Christ, who are not really prepared to face this final enemy. Maybe they're not genuinely converted, or maybe they are genuinely converted, but their lives have been um, marked by disobedience and indifference to the Lord and a failure to grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. And so, Heaven doesn't hold the reward for them that it could had they been faithful. You need to prepare yourself spiritually for the end of your life. Being prepared can transform your priorities, your relationships, your hopes, your fears, your goals. And the title again of this brand new series, The End is Not the End, Christian Death and What Comes After It. Don't miss this. And uh, this is something you need to know and provide the truth for all the other folks that you need to talk to when the reality of death comes up. And friend, nothing is more sobering than the need to be prepared to enter eternity. Make sure you're ready for death and what comes after it. Join us now as John brings the brand new study, The End is Not the End. And with the first lesson of the series, here's John MacArthur. We are returning to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and I want to read you verses 29 to 34 as the setting for the Word of God. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought, and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. That is a fascinating, fascinating little section. A number of questions and a very serious warning and indictment. Just exactly what is going on here? 
For twenty-eight verses uh, since the beginning of this chapter, we've been learning about resurrection, that we're all going to be raised in glorified bodies. All believers, the, all people who die will be raised, but this is about believers, and all of us will be raised in glorified bodies. We will be gathered into heaven in our final glorified form, eternal spirits, eternal souls, but with eternal bodies fit for heaven. This is the plan of God. This is what God is working out in redemptive history. And someday it will all come to its culmination when everybody is finally gathered into heaven in that final form in our resurrection bodies. We are all gathered in Christ, and Christ gives Himself and all of us to the Father so that God may be all in all. That's a kind of culminating moment in, in the middle of this chapter, and it's been clearly indicating to us that there is a real resurrection. We will rise. And what that says is we will be who we are in the life to come. We aren't going to buy into the philosophies of the Greeks, as Paul addresses them here, that we all sort of fade into the eternal being. We all kind of disappear and dissolve into the ultimate deity. We will be who we are forever. We will be ourselves forever. God has a plan for us, not in some blurred mass, but as individual persons. We will all rise in glorified bodies to be forever who we are. That is clear throughout the Scripture. Now this has some serious implications. The fact that you will be you forever in heaven, that I will be me forever in heaven in a perfected form, both soul and body, that has some very serious implications. Those implications can be seen in this text, but sort of coming up to the text, I would just remind you that this was the confidence of the saints throughout the Scripture. Job, who suffered so greatly, endured that suffering, never had his faith disappear. He even said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But he said this, I know that in my flesh I will see God. We know that. We know that when Jesus appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, He appeared, appeared there with Moses and Elijah. Who were Moses and Elijah? Is in two different words. It's conform, transform. Conform is something you can change. It's like an attitude or a posture. Transform is different. Transform is something that has to happen because of what's on the inside. So since you have Christ inside of you now, remember, you're not serving at a tabernacle built with human hands. You don't have a high priest that was selected from among men. You are not serving a shadow or a copy. You have a risen Savior who set an example for you so that you can copy that. And since that is in you, the Spirit of God is in you, not the Spirit of the world, not the Spirit of worry, the Spirit of the world, you get to reproduce that because it's on the inside. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what's in you has to come out. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, remember the Word of God that was spoken to you. And copy that in your heart. And copy that in your life. Oh, I forgot to read you the verse after that. I really, truly forgot. This is not a little thing I'm doing in my sermon. Verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he says, remember the leaders who spoke the word of God over you. Consider the outcome, how it worked out for them. And we use all kinds of excuses for bad examples. And so we'll do the same dumb things that we saw growing up, and this is what we'll tag it with at the end. And look at me, I turned out all right. Did you though? Did you really? Because maybe it just hadn't caught up with you yet. Like, 
Well, I yell and cuss at my kids. My dad did it too, and it was good for me, and I turned out all right. I don't think. I don't think you're all right. I'm watching you right now. I'm seeing there's a little bit of a wound, just a little bit of a wound, just a little something. How do you copy what you never saw? And he said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, like, the devil isn't very creative. God is a creator, the devil is not. The devil is so uncreative. Everybody, how uncreative is he? He's so uncreative that he only has three temptations. That's the only way he can tempt you. First John says, the lust of the world, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Lust of the eyes. This is the love of the world. I messed that up. I'm going to do this again. The love of the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Go to Matthew chapter 4. We said Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And a lot of times we think we're facing a brand new temptation, but we're not. It's just the same devil in a different disguise. I love helping my kids navigate their life the best I can, but it's tricky sometimes because we didn't have Snapchat, we didn't have TikTok. But the same devil that was busy on TikTok was busy on DOS or the rotary phone or fax machine or whatever you did with your messaging. Pigeon. It's the same devil. Everybody say, it's the same devil. And the same three things that you're tempted with that, that derail you and sabotage you and bring you back down and get you out of the pattern God showed you on the mountain, it's the same three things. It's in Matthew 4. So Jesus goes to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Last week when I finished, Graham, you remember, this is my son I love. Whom I'm well pleased. Grim is so funny. I said, Do you want a special meal after we baptize you? He said, Jesus didn't get a special meal. I'll eat whatever everybody else is eating. Jesus didn't get a special meal. He's so, he's so stupid. All right. So <laughs> he wasn't saying it because he was holy. He just was making a joke. The next thing that happened, Matthew chapter 4, everybody say, Copy that. So the affirmation of the Father and then the temptation from the enemy. This is a pattern that you can copy to be affirmed by your Father in heaven so that when you are tempted by your enemy in the wilderness, you will have at your core your knowing of who you are. So Jesus was then led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, you didn't do that, Graham, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I know you know the scripture, but let's just move through it because there's a lesson here for today. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down. Prove yourself. Show everybody what you can do. If you got it, flaunt it. Go ahead and show everybody who you really are. Go ahead and you know, you gotta make it happen for yourself. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. One more. Now we've already seen the lust of the flesh turn the stones into bread. That's when you try to turn things into things that they were not meant to be. That's when you try to turn sex into an object to gratify a spiritual need, so that rather in the context of marriage expressing your sexuality, you express it in places where it spills over and contaminates all the places of your life because it creates commitments that are not rooted in covenant but are rather rooted in convenience and pleasure, and so then the enemy can rip you out because you turned a stone into bread. 
This is when we go seeking for people's validations, when our Father's voice is not enough, when we didn't have a leader that spoke the word of God over us. Then we are open to what the world thinks about us, and we will change everything until we get the exact, uh, the exact compliment, the exact affirmation, the exact validation we were looking for. That's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, you know, and the pride of life. This one right here, I've dealt with this a lot in my life. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, verse 8, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Now, I never bowed down and worshiped the devil like that. But I have. Worshipped what the world worshipped. I have at periods in my life thought that a certain level of success would make me a real man. I have thought that a certain amount of money would make me secure. And it really has to do with worship. I don't want to depend on God to be. Your hand brought me the way I knew not. He allowed this to happen. And if he allowed me to suffer, I comforted myself, not in the goodness of the master, but the goodness of God, that if he allowed me to go through this kind of suffering, that some kind of way there's something that he wants me to get out of it, or he wouldn't have allowed it to happen. I don't know if that helps you like it helps me, but, 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 but that really helped me. These reflections gave me a little comfort, and I rose at last from the deck with dejection and sorrow in my countenance, yet mixed with some faint hope that the Lord would appear for my deliverance. In other words, I was holding on by a thread, but I tied a knot in it, and I held on. Is there anybody in here that's been through enough suffering in your life that you held on by a thread and you were just holding on by the skin of your teeth and you made it over and sometimes you felt like giving up and sometimes you felt like dying and sometimes you felt like committing suicide but there was just a little just a little bit of ray of light just a little little bit of light coming into the dark arc that lit it just enough for you to press your way through the storm and the rain and lit Listen at how he gets the light. He gets the light by what he says to himself. It is the way you talk to yourself that determines whether you endure hardness or not, whether you can stand affliction or not. It is what you choose to think about. He said, I, I chose to believe that God would bring me out of this. An 11-year-old boy says, I chose to believe that God would bring me out of this, that he was to teach me something. And rather than to focus on the bitterness of my disappointment, I focused on the fact that some kind of way I'll come out of this wiser and stronger and better and richer and fuller. These are the first scenes of my life, though that pleasure has been for the most part mingled with sorrow. The truth of the matter is there's not a person in this room that has not had their pleasure mingled with sorrow. This slave boy who is 11 years old from Nigeria, from the tribe of Igbo, who was captured and abducted, and don't think that that has stopped happening. Human trafficking is still happening. Don't think that it ended with the Emancipation Proclamation. Slavery is still alive or well in this country and around the world. People are still living in abducted situations out of their control in this city, in this state. There are people that are against their will being held in bondage and there are task force set up by a police department that do nothing every day but work to liberate young girls and young boys that have been snatched out of their country and made to work without pay right in your city right up under your nose and I laugh when I hear us say if I had lived in slavery days I would I, if I you are living in slavery days as long as there is inequity there will be 
slavery for somebody, you just choose not to look at it, but it is there every week. Somebody gets busted for taking somebody from their country and having them working in massage parlors and different places that you might frequent. You have to have your eyes open because sometimes the people who are giving you service are doing it against their will. He says, early on, I accustomed myself to look for the hand of God in the minutest occurrence. Any little sign of any little touch, I look for the hand of God. And to learn from it a lesson of morality and religion. And in this light, every circumstance I have related was to me of importance. I look for God even in pain. After all, what makes any event important unless by its observation we become better and wiser? What makes any event important if we don't use it to become better and wiser and learn to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before God? Can I go on with this? I love this. I love that. You should get the books. You should, you should order the book. To those who are possessed of this spirit, there is scarcely any book or incident so trifling that does not afford some profit, while to others the experience of ages seems of no use. And even to pour out to them the treasures of wisdom is throwing the jewels of instruction away because some people have a deaf ear to wisdom. They have no value to profoundness. Their mind Minds are so narrow that even when you give them good things, they throw it away. Jesus said it this way, cast not your pearls to the swine, neither give that which is holy to the dog. Come on, talk to me, somebody. He said, and I had a great curiosity to talk to the books as I thought they did to me. And so to learn how all things had a beginning, for that purpose I have often taken up a book and have talked to it. And then when nobody was looking, I put my ears to it in hopes it would answer me. In other words, I so valued wisdom that I let the book that talked to me, I talked back to it and then listened to see if I said something, maybe it would say something to me. If you start listening for books to talk to you, especially the Bible, you would be surprised how the Bible will be your counselor, will be your advisor, will speak wisdom. And, and, and you would be surprised what it will do for you in your life if you would listen, if you would not just depend on the preacher to do all the feeding, but if you would develop a relationship and start listening and have an ongoing conversation with the Word. He said, and I have been very much concerned when I found it remained silent. Something said nothing to me at all, but I was listening. I was listening. I want you to understand these quotes because I think they are powerful and I think they are relevant and I think they are profound. And if you'll give me just a few minutes, I'm going to tie them into Apostle Paul and show you why I talked about it. He says, oh, ye nominal Christians, might not an African ask you, learn you this from your God? Your religion allows you to do this to me? How can you worship God and steal me? Eventually he found his way to freedom and became a husband and a father and a very successful entrepreneur. And I want you to see the before and after pictures. One shows him as a slave and one shows him as an entrepreneur. If he would have Paper Ghosts is a true crime podcast investigating the mysterious disappearance and brutal, unsolved murder of Tammy Zawicki. They just kept telling us from the beginning, she'll, she'll be back, she'll be back. We had no clue where she was. Didn't know where to begin looking. Tammy's story shocked the nation. The deeper I searched, the more troubling things I found. The best lead, the best evidence, the best witness was blown off. Listen to Paper Ghosts on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. 
In 1967, Joseph Stalin's only daughter flees Russia for her new home, America. Hello to everybody. I am very happy to be here. That story alone is worthy of a podcast, but Svetlana Svetlana is about what comes next, and it's the craziest story I've ever heard. It has KGB agents, a Frank Lloyd Wright commune, weird sex stuff, three Olgas, two Svetlanas, and one neurotic gay playwright. That's me. Listen to Svetlana Svetlana on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Have you ever watched The Exorcist and wondered, are demons real? Well, we interviewed a leading exorcist to find out, and the truth was shocking. Tell me who you are. The one you won't get out. The one you can't. Levitations, vomiting, spitting at the priest with an uncanny marksmanship. That has not been a movie for me. Listen to The Exorcist Files on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let me have your undivided attention. This is my very white opening for the morning. I want you to have a great time. Come on and join in with us. Put your hand on somebody's back and say, hey, I love you. And allow them to say, I love you. And together we can have love in this world, and this world will have more love. Yeah, but that ain't working right now. So welcome to the Steve Austin <laughs> Morning Show. <laughs> See where you get that from? I don't know. Just came to me. Thought I'd do it. Ain't no need to do the same thing. It's a new day, new chance, new opportunity, man. Let's make the best of it. God is good. Yeah, he is, man. Gratitude affects your altitude all the time, but it's brought on by your attitude. You got to get it together, baby. That's the world we live in today. Shirley Strawberry, Carla Pharrell, Mouth of the South, Junior Boy, and my man, myself. Yeah. Happy <laughs> me to me. <laughs> I like that, Steve. I like that. You know what I mean? Sometimes, man, yeah. just ain't got no cheerleader cheer for yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's man, right. Clap That's it right. up for yourself. So sometimes you got to clap it up for yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like Snoop mm-hmm. Dogg said, yep. I want to thank me. <laughs> I want to thank me. <laughs> me. Last but not least, I want to thank me. Believe in yourself. Love yourself. <laughs> yeah. So, Feeling Junior, what's on today, your mind Steve? today? I just said, are you feeling pretty good today? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I yeah. You sound good. That's why yeah, I'm asking. Yeah, I feel good sound every good. day. I, you know, yeah. whatever it is, mm-hmm. whatever it is. You know, some days have some few more challenges in it than others, and mm-hmm. but I'm I done survived all of them so far. This too shall pass. That's for Amen. sure. Yeah, Amen. and I'm Amen. expecting great things to happen in my life, man. Mm-hmm. I did yeah. a gratitude check yesterday. I really did have to do a gratitude mm-hmm. check because what I found out was. As humans, and I find myself guilty of this often, in my quest to do better and be better. Two minutes after the hour, Junior's in for the nephew to run that prank back right after this. You're listening to the Steve Harvey Morning Show. When my daughter ran off to hop trains, I was terrified I'd never see her again. So I followed her into the train yard. This is what it sounds like inside the boxcar. And into the city of the rails. There I found a surprising world, so brutal and beautiful that it changed me. But the rails do that to everyone. There is another world out there. And if you want to play with the devil, you're going to find them there in the rail yard. I'm Danelle Morton. Come with me to find out what waits for us in the city of the rails. Listen to City of the Rails on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts or cityoftherails.com. In 1967, Joseph Stalin's only daughter flees Russia for her new home, America. Hello to everybody. I am very happy to be here. That story alone is worthy of a podcast, but Svetlana Svetlana is about what comes next, and it's the craziest story I've ever heard. It has KGB agents, a Frank Lloyd Wright commune, weird sex stuff, three Olgas, two Svetlanas, and one neurotic gay playwright. That's me. Listen to Svetlana Svetlana on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. In 2018, it was reported there was a dramatic rise in the number of cases of demonic possession. For many of the most disturbing cases, Father Carlos Martins was often summoned. I have seen things, very evil things. I order you to go in the name of Christ. I'm not leaving. We've been together too long. 
He needs me. Listen to The Exorcist Files on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. The distribution and the fact that men are stringently selected for, let's say, the capacity to acquire a position in a competence hierarchy and women are brutally punished in terms of their sexual attractiveness for not manifesting signs of fertility and youth. It's like there's a real harshness to that, yeah, but it's the yeah. harshness. I think it's the harshness of life. And actually understanding that makes it less harsh insofar as understanding is useful. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would agree with that. And, you know, I mean, uh, I've stumbled across a lot of findings in my research and, and we'll get to the issue of conflict between the sexes. Uh, that that I find personally distressing, you know, that I, I wish didn't exist, um, but they do. And so I, I feel similarly that, you know, we're better off confronting our nature and the empirical reality, including sex differences in that nature, rather than just pretending that these features don't exist. Well, we also should be very cognizant of the fact that the counterclaim, which is that, well, there are no biological uh, what what do you say? Structures underlying our perception, sexual perception, and otherwise, and our cognition. So we have no biological nature, which means we're it means we're uh, infinitely amenable to social utopian schemes that are designed to turn us into a particular vision of human. And there's great danger in that too. So that's the other side of yeah, the coin. Yeah. There's danger everywhere. Yeah. Well, what I would say is. Yeah, the, the yeah implicit in those notions is that humans are um, passive passive vehicles rather than active strategists that can be easily manipulated by whatever, uh, and that's not a very um, that's not a very flattering view of humans. Uh, so. Um, no, and it's justified some rather wide scale social engineering attempts in the last hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it is a real danger. It's not. It's, and then that that doesn't take away anything from the fact that there are such thing. There is such thing as unpleasant fact. Yes. So, and, and it's it's reasonable to be cognizant of that. So, so you were going to talk a little bit about. Um, uh, uh, let's talk about violence, say, between men and women. One of the things I was struck by in your chapter on violence, the way it opened. People, I studied aggression for a long time in, in little kids, in, uh, uh, in, in elementary school children, adolescents, all the way up, developmental origins of aggression with, with Richard Tremblay in Montreal. And so I'm very interested in that. And I, I think often that psychologists have things backwards when we approach questions. You know, so for example, we often try to explain anxiety instead of explaining its control, which is way harder to do because like... Of course you're anxious. That's bloody obvious. Why aren't you terrified out of your skull all the time is the question. And I think it's the same with aggression. It's, we, it's often treated as if aggression itself is something that needs to be explained. Whereas for me, the mystery is, well, no, aggression, not of course. Yeah. The mystery is how we control it. That's the mystery. Yeah. And well, so, yeah, well, and, 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 and we do. I mean, it's... Um you know, uh, aggression is selectively deployed, uh, you know, and is very context specific. And I mean, it gets back to, I mean, it depends on, I don't know whether you were, um, whether you studied physical aggression, but you were asking earlier about differences between male and female hierarchies. And one of the things that is well documented is that while men are higher in physical aggression, um, including all the way up to homicide, women, um, engage in uh, social aggression or what's sometimes called relational aggression where they, they they shun someone or exclude someone or slut shame another woman and so that's mm -hmm. a, a form of aggression yeah reputation savaging yes yeah derogation of competitors um so but 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 it, it, it but all these forms of aggression are typically deployed very selectively you know, it's not like we don't wake up in the morning and go out and beat someone up. You know, even those who engage in physical aggression, um, it's often someone has uh, humiliated them in public, for example, um, or, or challenged their, their status. And But uh, that's one of the things... Yeah, or that, they've perceived that, however incorrectly. Yes, yeah. So one of the things that I studied is um, uh, homicidal ideation, you know, and I looked at... Uh, 
you know, have you ever had a homicidal thought? Have you ever thought about killing someone? And basically, I mean, the majority of people have thought about it. Uh, and even, even though if, if they haven't, they'll say something like, when I pose this question just informally at, say, a party, people say, oh, no, I've never thought about killing someone. Uh, but then the conversation will proceed, and then they'll say, actually, there was this one time when someone humiliated me in front of the whole group, and I just had this thought about killing him. And so, fortunately, most homicidal thoughts don't get translated into homicidal deeds. Otherwise, we'd be living in a very chaotic society. Uh, but... Um, but one of the things that we found in that research was that being humiliated in, in public in the eyes of the peer group, meaning you're going to lose your status, was a key trigger of this homicidal ideation. Well, okay, so let me run something by you in relationship to emotional regulation and status. Tell me what you think about this. So the terror management theorist types tend to think that our cognitive beliefs inhibit our anxiety. And they drill that all the way down to anxiety mm -hmm. of death, taking a page from Freud. And that's Becker's book, basically. And there's yeah. a whole field of psychology that's worked on that. I think it's, I don't think it's right. I think it's more indirect. So imagine this. Imagine that the degree to which your negative emotion is regulated is dependent on serotonic Serot serotonergic output fundamentally so as your serotonin levels rise you're more emotionally stable so you feel less anxiety despair the whole panoply of negative emotions which are pretty tightly clumped together and so then you might say well your emotion emotional regulation is dependent on your status and i think there's truth in that now let's say i do we're at an academic conference and i stand up and i ask you a question and it's a mean question, but you can't answer it, so your status is devalued. But here's what I've actually done. It's not exactly that I've devalued your status. What I've done is undermined the claim that you have a valid claim on that position. Yeah. Right? And then yeah. that's going to dysregulate you because if that's true, then, well, you've been shown to be an imposter, let's say, and or at least the threat is there, and then that would take you out of that hierarchy and your negative emotion would rise. And then the reason it would r r rise is because if you are removed from that hierarchy and now you're alienated and isolated, everything has become way more dangerous. Yes. And so, right. And, so, you know, you know, the people at the bottom of a hierarchy are much less, much more likely to die from all cause mor mortality. Right. This right. is not nothing. Right. Including, this is crucial. Including getting killed. Uh, yes. Including yeah. that. Yeah. So, so to threaten that, and then you say, well, that invokes homicidal ideation quite rapidly. It's like, well, if you're interfering with the with the person's claim on a position that actually does regulate their negative emotion, as well as actually protect them from death, not just death anxiety. Then Elihu said, Hear my words, you wise men. Give ear to me, you who know. For the ear tests words as the palate tests food. Let us choose what is right. Let us determine among ourselves what is good. For Job has said, I am innocent, and God has taken away my right. In spite of my right, I am counted a liar. My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. What man is like Job, who drinks up scoffing like water, who goes in company with evildoers and walks with wicked men? For he has said, It profits a man nothing that he should take delight in God. Therefore, hear me, you men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. For according to the work of a man he will repay him, and according to his ways he will make him befall him. Of a truth, God will not do wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Who gave him charge over the earth, and who laid on him the whole world? If he should take back his spirit to himself, and gather to himself his breath, all flesh would perish together, and man would return to dust. If you have understanding, hear this, listen to what I say. Shall one who hates justice govern? Will you condemn him who is righteous and mighty, who says to a king, worthless one, and to nobles, wicked man, who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. In a moment they die. At midnight the people are shaken and pass away, and the mighty are taken away by no human hand. For his eyes are upon the ways of a man, and he sees all his steps. There is no gloom or deep darkness where evildoers may hide themselves, for he has not appointed a time for any man to go before God in judgment. 
he shatters the mighty without investigation and sets others in their place. Thus, knowing their works, he overturns them in the night, and they are crushed. He strikes them for their wickedness in the sight of men, because they turn aside from following him and had no regard for any of his ways, so that they caused the cry of the poor to come to him, and he heard the cry of the afflicted. When he is quiet, who can condemn him? When he hides his face, who can behold him, whether it be a nation or a man? That a godless man should not reign, that he should not ensnare the people. For as anyone said to God, I have borne chastisement, I will not offend any more. Teach me what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will do it no more. Will he then make repayment to suit you because you reject it? For you must choose and not I. Therefore, declare what you know. Men of understanding will say to me, and the wise man who hears me will say, Job speaks without knowledge. His words are without insight. Would that Job were judged to the end, because he answers like wicked men. For he adds rebellion to his sin, and claps his hands among us, and multiplies his words against God. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast to my words. Keep my commandments and live. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. And whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a fair garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your gift. We thank you for revealing your heart to us as you reveal yourself to us always, constantly through this journey of this Catholic Bible in a year. We ask that you continue to lift up our minds and hearts to you as you reveal your mind and your heart to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Um, Man, oh man, one of the words in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis is go to Joseph. It's three words. Uh, go to Joseph, um, ite ad Joseph in Latin. And it's, it's, it becomes the uh, a marker, in fact, for many of those people who have a devotion to St. Joseph. So in so many ways, what do we do? When we go to Our Lady, when we go to Mary, she points us to Jesus. So we approach Mary and say, Mary, bring me to your son. There are so many ways in which the Lord God has given us this foster father of Jesus as well. Uh, St. Joseph in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, to be the one that we can go to, the one who um, took care of the food, the bread from heaven, the one, who, the one who guarded the bread from heaven to be able to be distributed to people who were dying of hunger. That's us. That's Jesus in the Eucharist. And that's us who are dying for him. And so what we do is we can have a devotion to St. Joseph. In fact, there's this remarkable uh, consecration to St. Joseph done by um, Father Calloway. And it is a remarkable journey of 30 or so days To get to know Joseph better, the one who's silent in the New Testament, silent in the Bible, but to have a heart like his. We realize the Old Testament Joseph had a heart as well, a heart like like God's. Because why? Because he was faithful. That we talked about these yesterday, but how Joseph, God was with him. But also Joseph fought for God to be with him. Like Joseph could have, he had opportunities, Old Testament Joseph had opportunities to rebel, he had opportunities to sin, but he fought to stay faithful to the Lord, and he was faithful to the Lord. Well, no matter what we're going through today, uh, we also are invited to do the same, to fight to be faithful, to go to Joseph and let him take us through his intercession, the New Testament Joseph, but his inter- intercession to take us to his, <laughs> his foster child, but his Lord, our God, Jesus Christ. Keep praying for each other as we continue this journey with each other. Uh, we are now launched into the fourth week. You know, it's day 22 today and um, you're trucking along. So keep it up. Don't don't give up. We're almost to the end of Genesis and we're almost to the end of the book of Job. 
but we have just started. So let's keep each other in prayer. My name is Father Mike, and I cannot wait to see you tomorrow. God bless. Do you agree with Dr. Rosen about your approach? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> I almost got in a lot of trouble with my Canadian friends. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> all right. I can guarantee you that there are a number of folks in Canada that would like to put this together. Okay? I really, really, wherever you live. Uh, now, I wouldn't want to be in Canada in January. Okay? Might not even be able to get to Canada in January. But Canada is just not far away. Okay, that that that's not if you okay, England, Australia, that's different. This is no excuse. Hey, we have Canadians come down here all the time. They, if they can drive down, we can drive up, you know. <laughs> yeah, we can do. Um, they may not let me across the border, but they I, I'm gonna be in Vancouver uh, in in just a couple of weeks. So that's not an excuse. All right, so let us know where you are. But, Alan Rule, one last time. Will you or will you not? You say, I go to the States often. I will contact AO Min when I go next. No, no, no. We need to find a location. We're happy to go where you are. It doesn't have to be anything that costs you anything. Are you telling me that you live so far out in the outback? That there are no truly conservative Christian churches that would be interested in something like this nearby you? Where do you live? I'm not going to let this drop. You made the challenge. This is a vitally important subject. You made a false statement that illustrates one of the key issues of the errors of Roman Catholicism. And I am absolutely confident that the debating of that subject would illustrate for people who would not see it in any other way what the danger of paddling around the middle of the Tiber River is. And there are a bunch of people out there doing that because they don't see what you're actually demanding. They think this is like the difference between being a Lutheran and a Methodist. It's not. It's not by any stretch of the imagination. So will you do it? If we come to you Will you defend what you wrote in that statement? I understand. I understand that you know you can't defend it. I get it. But I also think you understand you know that you have to try to be able to substantiate your position. Because you you realize what you, what you stated is exactly what Jerry Matitick said in our debate on Long Island. Exact same epistemological warrant for believing the resurrection as the bodily assumption. What you just said, my belief in the high Christology is based upon the papacy. It's the exact same thing. You know it. I know it. Debating it would help everybody else to know it. And see, from my perspective, it helps every Christian to recognize how non-Christian Romanism is. That's why I'm willing to do it. I got plenty of other stuff to be doing. But this is important. This is really important. And I'm not the one that wrote the words. You came after me. You, No one forced you to do it. You did it of your own free will. Let's do it. Let's talk about it. Um, okay, one last thing here on the Steve Tassie thing. I have the time index. And here we go. Maybe he's just mad at me. Maybe he's the greatest person in the world. But, but he's going on about how just how totally unkind and mean and grumpy I am because it was, I said it was hot. Um, it was. Um, and I said we were late getting started. We were 15 minutes. Um, and I'm, I'm just this totally unkind person. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, I was See, this type of thing never crosses my mind. But he was incredibly distant. He did not welcome me. He didn't even look like he wanted to shake my hand. 
I mean, I could turn all this around and fire it back at him, and it would be just as valid. I just don't do that kind of thing. It's not about me. It's not about him. It's not about personalities and stuff like that. It's about the issues. You know? I mean, I went down, and, you know, during the break, I went down, talked to folks. You know, there were people that were trying to come up beforehand when we were prepping, Want me to sign books? If I, got, I, I can't because if I sign yours, the next person to come up, the next person, and it's gonna. I can't do this. Can I just mention, folks, when right at the, at the start of a debate, unless someone comes down and stands there alone in front of the audience, they might be doing other things. They might be preparing. You know, they're gonna be speaking. I was looking over Romans nine uh, one last time, just just going over stuff, and I kept, people kept coming up. Kept, I'm sorry, I can't. You know, I can't do that right now. But then once the debate started, I had made my opening presentation. What did I do during the break? Went down, met with people, talked with people, was there till I don't know what time at night, very, very late, uh, talking with folks. So he's just doing the, he's just the nasty, he's just a nasty, nasty guy. But then he's going to get to what I did say to him right now when we, uh, when I shook his hand at the end. Certainly from the time he got here to the time he left, he sat here and rebuked me when he left, when I went over to shake his hand afterwards, that, uh, you know, I'm the worst debater in the world that he's ever seen, and again, compared me to a Muslim. That's, that's a breaking the rules of debate. It's an attack on my character.